and welcome to this video which is all about this thing. This is the Korg Poly 61 and a special thank you to Richard again for lending me a synthesizer that I can do some videos for the channel. So uh, this uh, particular box is an early-ish model. Um, it wasn't a, a super early one because it does have MIDI on it, but it was an early-ish model. Um, so this was a synthesizer that was produced in 1982. And I actually know very little about this synthesizer. Um, it didn't really come on my radar at all in terms of um, of what, what this synthesizer was capable of. Um, but it's a very simple synth. It follows the, the digital control analog uh, wave generation um, mantra, which was what the JX8P was when I reviewed that a, a couple of weeks back um, and played with that. This is very much along the same, same lines. It has effectively uh, DCOs in there instead of VCOs. Um, and the whole, whole the whole control mechanism is a digital control mechanism with an analog wave generation system. So this is an analog synth. It's only got one output, so mono output um, on the back of it. There's no stereo feed, so that gives you a rough idea of when this was released. Um, and in terms of the the interface, it is actually very very simple. There is a uh, a pitch bend here, which is really interesting because if you go um, if you push it up, you then interact with the DCO, and if you push it down, you enter, enter out with the VCF. Um, so that's quite interesting. I'll put a graphic up when we, we come to that. And then along here, as you can see, there's, there's no knobs and faders, really. There's some push buttons. Um, there's a volume knob. There is a, um, uh, two buttons here which control the, how the joystick interacts. There is a master tune button which allows you to flatten or sharpen the sound. Um, at the moment it's, it's set dead on, but... It... Like so. Um, then we've got some value um, buttons, so you know if you want to change the value of something it's a plus or minus there. Uh, then we've got some program parameters, one through eight. Um, which in, the, in what this calls the program selection. So if I've got it in program, then I can select um, different programs. And if I've got it in parameter mode, uh, and at the moment I've got it on parameter 22, which is waveform, I can... Like subtly changing, um, but you're very limited in terms of what you can and cannot do with this this particular section here. So you know it's either it's one or the other. So um, it's a much simpler interface than what I was playing around with on the the J uh, X8P the the other day. Um, so that's that kind of mode. There's a right button there for being able to write the parameters to uh, a certain location. Then we come on to here, which is key assign mode. So, you know, this is in poly mode at the moment. So it plays that. Then there's something called chord memory mode. Which I don't know what quite what that does. And then we have this sort of latched mode. Which I assume is, is, is like um, having a, um, a pedal attached to it. Um, and then we have this bit up the end, which is an arpeggiator, which actually is not a bad. Enough of that for a moment. So there you go, that's kind of a, a very simple rendition of the Poly 61. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram 
and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. So let's look at where this synth kind of sat. As I said before, it's it was released in 1982 and it had a production run between 1982 and 1986. Um, so it was four years, which probably wasn't bad for a, for a synth like this. Um, it followed on from the successful Poly 6, which was released before it, um, and you'll see a noticeable difference in the interface because the Poly 6 has more knobs and faders, this doesn't have that. Um, and it works much in the same way as the JX8P. But this synth wasn't well received. And it wasn't well received for a number of issues. The first was people didn't like this interface. It wasn't an interface that people could get on with. I think that you, know, you were coming from a, a world of knobs and faders and all of a sudden you took all those away and just gave them a few buttons. People didn't like that. That wasn't where where people were at this point in time. So that was the, one of the first issues. Um, was was that the second issue was that the world all of a sudden introduced something called MIDI. Uh, and MIDI, uh, for those who don't know, MIDI version one was ratified in 1982, which is the year this was launched. And this was launched towards the end of '82. Remember that. Um, so MIDI had been ratified. This was designed and developed without the MIDI standard. Okay, and MIDI was, I know that you can see, if you can see the back here, the MIDI was retrofitted to this machine, it's there. Um, MIDI was retrofitted to this machine. Um, but it, this machine wasn't a MIDI designed machine. And it suffered for that. And the last reason, and probably the most prolific, prolific reason why this machine didn't do very well, was the Yamaha DX7. So the Yamaha DX7 came out within months of this being launched and at that point the world went digital. The Yamaha DX7 went mental and people rather than invest in this machine were investing in the Yamaha DX7. Now I know the, ver the first implementation of the Yamaha DX7 the MIDI wasn't particularly great but it still was a completely digital synth, worked in a different way, and had a massive program programmability uh, or capability on it, much more than this particular machine does. So people would have just moved over to the DX7. The next machine that came after this was the DW8 8000, and that also has a really quite lackluster um, delivery to the market. Korg reinvented themselves, came back to the market in the late 80s with the M1, and the rest of the story is kind of already written. But at this point in time, they were kind of struggling with instruments into the market space, and this was one of those struggles. Um, one of the things you see with the MIDI implementation of this particular machine is it literally is there, and it's just a, I will put a, a graphic up on screen, but it is literally just a MIDI in and out. Um, and that limited what the, where this machine could be placed in your, in your rig. So if you had machines that could do in, out and throw, um, basically you could jay chain your MIDI from your master source down to the, the lowest uh, module in the daisy chain. This, you couldn't. You either re were receiving MIDI on it or you were sending MIDI. You, there was no way to daisy chain this. And that was, for many MIDI musicians in sort of the early 80s, that was a severe limitation because they needed machines that they could daisy chain. A lot of the MIDI control gear didn't arrive on the market until mid to late 80s. So, you know, if you think about the splitters and the mergers and all the other stuff, that didn't arrive until sort of a number of years after the standard was ratified. Um, so, you know, if you were, if you were trying to work with these machines. You want really what had to be able to daisy chain the modules and what have you. Um, so that severely limited what this could do. Now, there was an aftermarket option um, to have MIDI installed on this. And this has obviously been fitted with that aftermarket option because you can see from the way that the case is, has, has been modified effectively that this was not 
on the original. There is a label that has been printed onto the onto the case uh, and the MIDI has been put in. So this was an option. So whoever bought this brand new had that option fitted. Um, but that wasn't a manufacturer's option. And, and it's as I say, it's not my synth, otherwise I would open it up and show you how that's been done. Um, now, in 1984, they issued the second version of the Poly 6, 61, so I should say, and that was called the Poly 61M, funny enough, with M standing for MIDI. And at that point, this synth had the MIDI retrofitted as a basic, as, as an out-of-the-box feature. But where we are now with this particular synth that I've been loaned, this is not an out-of-the-box feature. This has been, is an option that's been added to the machine either via the Korg dealer in the UK or um, at the factory at the point of, point of order, but it wasn't a standard feature of this particular key, keyboard. So what are the basic stats of this machine? Well, if I move my notes out of the way, from here to here is 61 notes. So, okay, a lot of synthesizers around this time were kind of either 49 or 61. So this is a 60, 61 note keyboard. Um, and it's, it's synth keys, and in fact actually they're quite, they are springy but they're actually quite loose, there's very little resistance. Now that could be just due to age, you know, remember this is 1982, we're now in the year 2000, so that's 30 years, 40 years ago, alright, so that's 2000, 2021 is where we are, but that's 40 years ago. So my, my math is not brilliant when I'm trying to do that on the fly and talk at the same time. Um, but it is, for how old this is, it's actually perfectly playable. It's very playable, actually. Um, so it's 61 notes. Um, it does, it's six note polyphony, so six, um, six voices, as they say nowadays. So that means I can... Six notes at a time. Sounds a bit funny. I'm not sure that is picking up six notes. Just put the... There you, go. you can hear that. Um, as it's cutting in on the last note. So six voices, two DCO operators per voice, um, which seems to be a, a very similar architect for many of the synthesizers produced in the 80s that were doing this digital control analog generation um, style of operation. Um, and you could have 64 patches on this particular machine. So that's why there is eight numbers along there, which was kind of what a lot of um, manufacturers did at the time. Roland definitely did this, where they had bank and tone. This is the same, except on this, you put it into program mode and you type in 13, which is program 13, and 16, which is program 16, or patch 16 on which way you want to look at it. Um, so that was kind of the, the sort of the basic stats of this. Um, one of the, the key things that it was criticised for was the, the way that they implemented the um, attack, decay and sustain and release. Um, this machine uses a 4-bit D to A converter, uh, which means you can only actually have 16 position points on the various pieces. And if you look here where it says EG, um, I suppose that stands for envelope generation, uh, <laughs> at, a, at a guess, um, you can see that the attack, decay, sustain, and release are 41, 42, 43, and 44 are the program parameters. And you can only have values between zero and 15. Now, a lot of the, the synth at this point in time had much wider ranges in terms of what they could use. So that kind of limited you know, the, the whole way you generated your envelope, but still perfectly perfectly usable. Um, so that was kind of the, the synth as it was. Um, I'm now gonna sort of just, probably just talk about a few bits and bobs on this particular synth and see, see where we go. Um, because my notes kind of run out at that point. I recorded this video in the summer. It's taken me several months to get round to doing the post-production on it. When I look back at the video, I realized that I'd recorded quite a lot of material. And some of it was really relevant, some of it I've scrapped, but it's still enough material for this to be three videos rather than the intended one. 
So, this is the end of part one. Tune in for part two. Until then, live long and prosper.